before you this night, thanking you for the chance to be in your house, Lord. Thanking you, uh, Father, for our salvation and the wonderful love of God that you have shown toward us, Lord, in so many ways. Father, we pray, God, uh, continue uh, we continue to pray, Lord, that your hand would be with the Hanks family, that you give them great grace during this time of, of grieving over the home going of Joanne. We pray, Lord, that you give them safe travel uh, to Ohio for the graveside uh, service there as they uh, bury Joanne, and that you just be with that family in a special way, Father. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with us here this evening. I ask that you'll speak through me, that you would magnify your name, God, and whoever's hearing over the internet might be blessed and challenged by the words here this evening. So, Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your son who has died and rose again, that we might have life and forgiveness of sin. And Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is in us to enable us and to guide us and empower us. And we thank you so much, Father. And we thank you for the Word of God. So, Father, please bless this time of study. Now, in Jesus' mighty and holy name I pray. Amen. All right, a couple of things right before we get into the Word of God. We'll be back and we'll be in Romans 15 tonight. Uh, but uh, a couple of things real quick. This uh, weekend is the time change. So when you go to bed uh, Saturday night, you want to set the clocks back one hour. Set your clocks back one hour so that you'll be to church Sunday morning on time. Amen? So that's this, this Saturday. And uh, or, um, you want to do that this Saturday night. All right. Uh, uh, prayer request. Uh, Rose uh, Black called me and her nephew I didn't get his first name, last name, Eckenrode. Her nephew had hip surgery, and there was an infection that somehow uh, started in his body. It's through his whole body now. He's in the intensive care unit at the hospital, and uh, we want to pray that this infection will clear up and not uh, take his life. Uh, we also want to pray for his salvation for him to come to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And then, uh, real quickly, just please keep Pamela in your prayers. We were up. I was uh, in the ER all night last night. We left there about 6.30-something this morning, and uh, I took her there. She had a, a fever of 103. Uh, she was extremely weak and tired. Uh, had a hard time just even getting dressed. And uh, she was badly dehydrated um, from the runs and vomiting and stuff of that nature. Uh, needless to say, they did blood work. They did a chest x-ray. Thank the Lord, the chest x-ray was clear. And there was nothing found in the chest x-ray. Uh, they did end up giving her two bags of fluid and they ended up giving her some potassium, and they also had to give her IV antibiotics because they did find uh, that she had a urinary tract infection. And so with COVID and the urinary tract infection, it made her very ill. And uh, she's a pretty strong-willed person, and when we got to the ER, she asked for a wheelchair, so I knew I knew she, she was not in a good way. She said, I, I need a wheelchair. And uh, so they took her. They wouldn't let me in. I had to stay in the parking lot, but that's par for the course these days. Uh, but thank the Lord she's at home resting, and she's taking some antibiotics, so we pray that that infection will clear up. All right, all right. So we're in Romans 15. I uh, wasn't able to be here last week. I apologize uh, for that. Kind of had a little setback myself last Wednesday, but I'm doing all right now. Um, and so we're continuing our study in Romans. And uh, Romans 14 basically started this whole discussion about things that are doubtful. In fact, uh, Romans chapter 14 and verse 1 says, 
Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Disputations means to argue or arguments, and doubtful means just that, doubtful. Arguing over things that are doubtful. In this case, uh, the Bible didn't speak, speak specifically about eating meats, and there was a debate in that church. Some people felt that they could eat any meat, uh, particularly a meat that was offered to an idol, that when that meat was sold in the marketplace, they felt there was no problem with buying that meat and eating it. Other believers felt like they should only eat vegetables and that there was a problem with it. Now, we went through the whole chapter two weeks ago, and so we would start on verse 15. Now, the first uh, seven verses of chapter 15 is still a continuation of that discussion. Uh, he says in verse 1, he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, we then points us back to verses 22 and 23. So to help us with a little bit of a review since it's been two weeks, let's look at those two verses, those last two verses in Romans. Uh, Romans 14.22 says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. What he's talking about, keep it in context. The context of that chapter is about uh, arguing over doubtful things or things that the Scripture's not clear on. And the broader argument uh, was about these meats. So, if you were a person that believed that it was alright to eat meat, then fine. Have that view between you and God. Happy is he that contemneth not himself and the thing which he alloweth. What's he mean by that? It means that if you were flaunting your Christian liberty, now you are committing sin. If uh, someone else thought they could only eat vegetables, you felt you could eat meat, and then you were going to eat that big old juicy steak right in front of them because you had the Christian liberty, now you're sinned in God's sight because you're offending your weaker brother. And so that's why he says, happy is he that condemneth not himself and that which he alloweth. If he doesn't condemn himself uh, because he's not flaunting it. Uh, I remember back in Bible college, one of my professors, he, he liked classical music. He, that was his thing. He liked gospel music, but he really liked to listen to classical music and one of the church members came by and the window was open. They heard him playing classical music and oh boy, was that a big problem. This church member felt like uh, he shouldn't be doing that, uh, that it was somehow worldly and wrong. Now the Bible doesn't say you can't listen to classical music. In fact, classical music does, scientifically, it has a benefit where rock music is, da is damaging to the body. That's been scientifically proven. Uh, flowers that have been put in a room and they played classical music, they flourished, they grew. Flowers, where they played rock music, the flowers died. That's just a scientific fact. It was an observable fact. But whether or not it's right or wrong to listen to classical music, it doesn't say. But uh, his opinion basically was, I'm just be careful about when I listen to my classical music and I'm not going to listen to it around him. Now, had he taken a view of it, I don't care what this fellow says. In fact, I'm going to start playing it when I'm in the church parking lot. Well, then he would have been sinning, amen? Even though he had the Christian liberty to listen to classical music, he would have been sinning. So, that's why he says, Happy is he that condemneth not himself and that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so here, on the other end of the perspective, here's that fellow that feels like he, can, he should only eat vegetables, uh, but he's emboldened to eat meat because he sees his brother eating meat, and so therefore he goes to, to eat meat, but his conscience is telling him not to, and yet he does it anyway. Well, uh, He's in sin because he's not following what his conscience is telling him. If your conscience is telling you that something is wrong, then you should not do it. If you can't do it, 
with a clear conscience, then don't do it. I'm going to give some guidelines in just a moment. But in verse 23, it says, He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. He was eating that meat, but not of faith, believing I'm eating it because I'm allowed to eat it. He was doing it because this other brother was doing it, and he felt in his heart it was wrong. All right, whatsoever, uh, uh, what, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So whatever you do, if you can't do it in full faith that it is all right to do it, then you're in sin, whether it's right or wrong. If you can't do it, knowing that it is all right, then it is sin. And so you have to be careful with things like that. All right, so when you get into verse uh, chapter 15, verse 1, he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So he's still basically rehashing and saying the same thing uh, over again. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. How, how, do, you do, how do you bear the infirmities of the weak? And, in other words, you, you're putting it on you. All right, so here's my brother. He's offended by me eating meat, so I bear his infirmity by not eating meat. I'll do without the meat. In fact, in another place in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, if eating meat offends my brother, then I'll not eat meat as long as the world standeth. That's a pretty long time, amen? And so, the stronger brother doesn't flaunt his liberty. The stronger brother sacrifices for the sake of the weaker brother till the weaker brother can grow uh, in his convictions, in his knowledge of the Word of God. Alright, so we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Don't please. When I got the Christian liberty to do this and it's alright for me to do this, no, you, you don't live to please yourself. You don't do that. Let everyone, verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now, he's not saying just do whatever your neighbor wants you to do uh, to make your neighbor happy. Obviously, if it's something sinful, you're not going to do it, period. But uh, what's he talking about here? And once again, neighbor is more focused down to another fellow believer. Uh, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. In other words, I suffer the wrong I suffer the wrong. Even though I am allowed to eat a steak, I'm not going to eat a steak if it's going to offend my brother. I am doing that for his good till he is built up. His edification, till he's built up in the faith. In other words, if he tries to convince his weaker brother or convince his will against his will, he's going to offend and lose his weaker brother. And so, what's the stronger brother going to do? He is going to uh, to be careful. He's going to be careful and he is going to do what he can for his brother's good. Whatever it's going to take to get the weaker brother to grow and to build the weaker brother up in the faith, that's what he is going to do. Now let's kind of, before we go any further, let's kind of define some things. A person who is spiritually mature the Bible reveals that to us. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 5. It uh, gives us a little definition there of, uh, of a spiritually mature believer. Hebrews chapter 5 and verses number 12 through 14. There the Word of God tells us this. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. The first principles of the Word of God. Uh, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. In other words, uh, the Word of God is talking here about these individuals. They've been saved long enough where they should be teachers, but instead they need to be taught and that they don't understand the first principles of the Word of God, the oracles of God and are become as such that need milk. You can't give them strong uh, doctrine. You can't give them strong meat. 
because they can't handle it. They're not ready for it. They can't understand it. So you have to give them milk. Unfortunately, this describes too many Christians in the day in which we live. They're milk Christians, and they should be on strong meat, but they're not ready. They cannot handle it. Verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So um, everyone uh, that uses milk, they don't know the word of God. They don't know how to understand and study and use the word of God. They are unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat, Strong meat, those deep things of the Word of God. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Right? You can't feed a baby steak. You can only feed them formula, milk. Uh, but listen, a guy like me, get that milk out of here. Baby formula, forget that. I want a steak. Amen? And this is the spiritually, this is what it should be. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So the spiritually mature brother, the spiritually mature, the strong brother, is the one that has his senses exercised. He has discernment. He has the ability to discern between both good and evil. So your strong brother can do what? He can determine what is good, what is evil, and what doesn't matter. And there are certain things that are good that we need to have part of our life. There are certain things that are evil that need to be out of our life. And then there are other things that don't matter. They just don't matter. And unfortunately, we spend too much time arguing over the things that don't matter. Amen? All right, what about that weaker brother? Once again, the weaker brother is characterized by a tender, oversensitive conscience. Uh, they just get real convicted real easy about things and things that aren't even necessarily bad. And so that's the weaker brother. That's the, the stronger brother. That's the difference. Now, uh, once again, as he's still talking to... Uh, uh, us about this subject back in Romans 15 and verse 3. He says, For even Christ pleased not Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on Me. And so here's the example of Christ. Whether you're a weaker brother or whether you're the stronger brother, we all need to follow the example of Christ. For even Christ pleased not Himself. Amen? He pleased not Himself. And, uh, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on Me. The reproaches. Uh, that word reproaches, it means slander, false accusations, insults, shame, disgrace. That's what it means. It all, He took all that. Now, there's a couple of views here. Let me give you the two different views. One view is because the Pharisees and the scribes uh, had a bad attitude against the true God of the Bible. And they were very religious and active in what they were doing, but obviously they were rejecting the true God and rejecting Christ. And they had all the stuff that they added to the law. And so, uh, because Jesus was coming and telling them the truth, they were getting upset. And when they were getting upset, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, the things that I speak are not my own, but I speak what the Father, the Father gives me to say, basically is what Jesus tells us in the Gospels. So when they heard what Jesus had to say, they start cursing Jesus. They start giving Jesus a hard time. Now, in reality, they were, they were cursing who? They were cursing God. But Jesus was enduring the ridicule. Amen? He was enduring the ridicule. Now, another view on this, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me, uh, some look at it from the other aspect of how uh, Jesus took all the, uh, all, all the harassment that his shielding the disciples from. In other words, as he had the disciples around him and as they were 
uh, preaching what he told them to preach, and they would go from village to village. They weren't often welcome, and they were with, met with harassment, and Jesus would take that. Jesus would take that. Instead of letting them reproaches fall on his disciples, he, he got in the way of that and, and took it on himself. And so whatever way you want to look at that, uh, either way is fine. Uh, and it just simply means the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. It's another example of suffering the wrong. Suffering the wrong. Christ was in the right, but yet He suffered the wrong for the sake of truth. For even Christ pleased not Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And that's a quote from Psalm 69, 9. Uh, I think it's John 15, 18 that says, If they hate you, ye know that, it, that they hated me before they hated you. And so, always understand, if, if people reject us, they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting the God that sent us. They're rejecting the Christ who gave us the message to preach. And so, and if they rejected him, they're going to reject us. Now, he gets into this thing about the scriptures being our example. And he says in verse number four For whatsoever things were written aforetime, those are the Old Testament writings. And basically, but when, when Paul is penning Romans, there isn't too many New Testament books yet. So their primary scriptures are the Old Testament at the time of Paul's writing here. All right, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. To learn what? What do the Old Testament scriptures teach us? That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So when we study the Old Testament, we learn patience is important. Nothing happens overnight. Amen? This is the problem in the society we live in today. Everything is instant. Everything is drive-through. And we even try to get our spirituality that way. And you cannot do it. You cannot do it. Uh, it takes patience. It takes patience with dealing with people. And believe me, after 26 years, I'm... <laughs> I've had to exercise an extreme amount of patience, and I still to this very moment do, and it is not always easy. But the Old Testament teaches us that, that, that patience, patience in our walk, patience in our waiting on God. Uh, sometimes people in the Old Testament prayed a long time before God intervened. Uh, we've got this crazy view about Job that somehow... Uh, after a week or so, Job was good to go. No, it was probably months uh, longer, maybe even longer before Job was good to go, before he had that blessing at the end of Job. Uh, he suffered for quite a long time with the things that he suffered. But all these things happened so that we could learn patience, learn to be. James 5.10 the, the epistle of James and chapter uh, 5, there the Word of God tells us this. James 5 and verse number 10, the Word of God says, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example. An example of what? An example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. They suffered affliction and, pa and they had patience in that suffering. And so we read the Old Testament, and what do we see? We see people going through things, going through hardships, and what do you do? You, you learn from that. We've got this candy store theology today that you just want it, you just name it, you just claim it, and you don't have to go through hard times. I had a guy tell me that one time. He, said, he, said, he ignorantly said to me, Bob, where does it say in the Bible we have to go through the valley? Try reading the Old Testament, amen? Who didn't go through the valley? Try looking at the Lord's life. He says he didn't have a place to lay his head. Amen? He suffered things. Try looking at the apostles in the book of Acts. They all suffered things. And they're an example for us that when we go through things, 
we need to have the same patience that they had. Now notice, it says in verse 4 of Romans 15, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So what are we going to learn? We're going to learn patience, that we, through patience, and the second thing we're going to learn, comfort of the Scriptures. You've got to learn how to read the Scriptures, get comfort from them. You read the Scriptures, you get comfort. You read the examples in the Old Testament. You read the Psalms. The Psalms, right? I'm always telling people because personally, this is what's a blessing to me is going in the Psalms. Uh, as soon as Shanda surgery went south and everything started going bad, I always keep my Bible on me. And uh, what did I do? I started Psalm 1 and I just started, kept on reading the Psalms. And not only that, but that five days while we were in the hospital, with Shanda, she couldn't speak to us, but we were told that she could hear us. What did I do? I, I prayed with her. I read the Scripture to her. Amen? Because there's power in the Word of God. It's living. It's quick. It's powerful. And we can gain comfort from the Scriptures. So, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we, through patience, that's one thing, and comfort of the Scriptures, that's a second thing. The result is what? One and one equals what? Might have hope. Hope in the Bible means confident expectation. It doesn't mean, well, maybe. I hope it don't rain. Maybe. No, it means confident expectation. This is going to happen. How am I going to have hope? By being patient and by staying in the Word of God. The comfort of the Scriptures. So i got to ask everybody, those sitting here, those listening on the internet, do you get comfort from the Word of God? Or is the Word of God just a dead book to you? And if it's a dead book to you, I would caution you that you need to examine your salvation. Amen? Not trying to get people to question their salvation, but if this book can't speak to you, something is wrong because the author of this book, the interpreter of this book, is living in you. We have been given an unction from the Father. That's what it says in the epistle of John. That means the resident truth teacher lives in us. Lives in us. And so, from the Word of God, we learn patience. We, learn, we get comfort from the Scriptures that we might have hope. Might have hope. He says in verse number 5, Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. The God of patience and consolation grant you, that's all the believers, to be like-minded one toward another. We need to have patience with one another. Why is God called the God of patience? Because He puts up with us. Amen? He said, well, He's got to put up with the lost. Forget the lost. He's got to put up with the saved. And all the bonehead stuff we do, and all the false accusations that believers send His way when things don't go their way. Ah, now, God has a lot of patience He exercises toward us. Now, the God of patience and consolation, where is true comfort going to come from? Going to come from God. Grants you to be like-minded. In other words, have patience with one another. Comfort one another. Console one another. Grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. In other words, uh, uh, following that same example as Christ. That you may be with one mind. Or excuse me, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this whole debate over, deba over doubtful things, over meat and vegetables, this whole debate was causing division in the church. And he's saying, no, no, listen, uh, the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, those local assemblies, there needs to be that spirit of unity and oneness that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
one mind, we think the same thing. One mouth, we speak the same thing. Amen? And, I mean, it's a, it's a shame of all the church splits that have happened throughout all the, the years. And, and most of them happen for ungodly reasons. You say, what's a godly reason for a church split? There's only one. Doctrine. If a church gets in the doctrinal era, then there's going to have to be a split. But if the doctrine is pure, correct, and right, there is no need for a split. Amen? None whatsoever. That dishonors God. And so there should be unity in every church, in every local assembly. All right, so he says in verse number 6, Now ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so once again, he's talking about receive. And I should have highlighted this, because that word it came up a number of times in chapter 14, uh, verse number 3 in chapter 14, for God hath received him, chapter 1 of, of chapter 14, uh, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. And so this idea of receiving one another, not shunning one another, not pushing one another away, not thinking we're better than the other person, uh, but receive one another. And why? What's the example? Well, the example, wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So I am to receive you in the same way that Christ has received me. He received me unconditionally. He had the offer. You want to be saved? I sure do. You want to follow me? I sure do. Come on. Unconditional. He didn't say do this, that, or the other thing, and then you can come on to me. He said, no. He says, all who come on to me, I will know why cast out. And we're to receive one another. Amen? We are to receive one another. And throughout history, uh, Christianity has woefully fell in this area of receiving one another. Receiving one another. All right, so now real quick, let me hit this. We'll start up with uh, in verse 8 next week, but guidelines for questionable things. I mean, if it's questionable, uh, you're not sure what the Word of God teaches it, or maybe the Word of God isn't very clear on it. Here's your guidelines for questionable things. Number one, does it please God? This thing I want to get involved in, does it please God? Number two, would I like the Lord finding me doing it when He returns? In other words, God's going to come back sometime, someday, some hour, moment, minute, second. And when He does, we're going to be doing something, right? Even if you're sleeping, you're doing something. But when God comes back, He's going to find you doing something. So that thing that's questionable that you're not sure about whether or not you should be doing would I like the Lord finding me doing it when He returns? Number three, can I ask God's blessing on it? Can I pray in full conscience, Lord, bless me while I do this thing? Well, if you can't ask God's blessing on it, then you shouldn't be doing it. Number four, would it cause a weak Christian to stumble? In other words, maybe it is perfectly legit, but is it going to cause my weaker brother to stumble? And in that case, then I don't do it, at least don't do it while that weaker brother is around. And number five, the fifth thing, would it cause an unsaved person to reject the gospel? And that fifth thing is extremely important because there have been so many people that have denied and rejected the faith simply because of the actions of those that said they were believers. And so, should I do it? Well, will it cause a, an unsaved person to reject the Gospel? Then I shouldn't do it. And that's how I should handle 
and deal with that uh, that questionable thing. All right, all right. So we'll pick up on verse eight next week. Any questions about anything before we close here? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word, Lord. I just pray that the Holy Spirit would give wisdom and understanding, God, and that you will speak to hearts in a special way. Lord, I pray that even the message preached yesterday at that funeral would still have your hand of blessing upon it, and as folks would hear it, they would be challenged and drawn into a closer walk with you, and if they're lost, that they would get saved. I pray, Father, that you would work mightily in our church. We need a revival, God. We need a revival. We need the attendance to go back up. We need people to get back in the pews, Father. Back where you've commanded them to be. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some are. Today, Lord, that verse would have to read as the manner of most are. And that's to our shame. And we will stand before a holy and righteous judge and give an account. Father, help us to see you move in a way that gets us to where we need to be, that we can stand before you, not ashamed, but fully confident that we have loved and served our Lord to the best of our ability. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen.